Ladies, I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. We're at the last chapter of 21 Balloons, where it all comes together. It's the best part, okay? Here's the picture of them swimming. Look at one of them way down and one of them up. Chapter 9, Concerning the Giant Balloon Life Raft. The next morning I ate breakfast with my fellow Krakatoans at Mr. C's Chinese restaurant. I will tell you quite frankly that I have no idea what I ate at any of the meals on sea day. I'm not too partial to oriental food and I didn't even dare to ask what I was eating for fear that any accurate description or analysis would only add to the uneasiness with which I suffered through each meal. I noticed that many of the children toyed with their dishes with equal apprehension. I used their method of eating some of the portions which consisted of removing the toasted almonds from the top carefully with a fork and leaving the rest. Mr. F scolded me for this display of timidity and poor taste and told me that to acquire an appreciation of good food I should show a little more courage and will to experiment. I assured him that while I had a great desire to become an accomplished gourmet while living under the restaurant government but I preferred to arrive at this in gradual stages over a long period of time. Mr. F. asked me what I wanted to do after breakfast. I told him that being on the island in the position of a perpetual guest with no work to do, I was fast getting to think of living in terms of holidays back home. On a hot Sunday in San Francisco, like this sea day of the month of lamb in Krakatoa, I would most probably go to some beach and do some swimming. I suggested a swim to Mr. F. He thought this to be a fine idea, so we put on our bathing suits and bathrobes and made our way through the outer fringe of jungle to a nicely cleared fine coral beach. I had arrived in Krakatoa on the afternoon of A Day. It was now the morning of C Day. In that short time, I'd become quite loose, used to walking about on the moving landscape. I was amazed at how fast I had acquired my mountain legs and fe felt rather proud of myself. The little beach looked very funny to me when I stopped and thought about it and compared it to beaches back home. For here the ocean was quite calm and the beach was going up and down. How's the swimming here, I asked. Excellent, said Mr. F. You'll see. I waded in the water up to my waist and there experienced a delightful sensation. The sand beneath me rose up with the surface of the earth until I found my feet completely out of the water. It then lowered me back down in the water up to my neck. I stood in one place and went in and out of water, spending a few seconds in the blazing tropical sun and then being dunked again up to my neck in clear, cool water, up and down, in and out, without having to move at all from the place where I was standing. Mr. F. had waded out a little deeper in the water than I had and seemed to enjoy being entirely dunked up over his head at the earth's lowest drop and then rising with the earth until he was only up to his knees in the water. Once, when temporarily up to my waist, I dove in toward deeper water to do a little swimming. I hadn't gone very far when I felt the sand rise beneath me and lift me by the stomach out of the water, a most peculiar feeling. Mr. F. explained to me that it was necessary to wade out quite far to do any good swimming. You should walk out far enough so that you are up to your waist in water when the surface of the earth beneath you is at the highest rising point. I did this, half walking and half dog paddling, and when I was far enough out, I enjoyed a good swim. Back on the beach, Mr. F. and I decided to take a sun bath. He told me that he had found it best to let the surface of the earth roll you around when it moved and not to try to lie in any one position. We did this and were nicely toasted on all sides by the hot sun. I was enjoying a most pleasant morning and decided right away to make this a daily habit. The night before, I had borrowed an atlas from Mr. F. and had looked up Krakatoa in it before going to sleep. I found that it was situated in the Sundra Strait between Sumatra and Java and that it was about 25 miles from both of these two huge islands. Looking at the map and trying to place the path of my voyage in the globe, I was amazed to see how much land I had missed on my trip. I must have flown between Mindano at the southern end of the Philippines and the Celebes Islands over the Celebes Sea. I must have flown over Borne Borneo one whole night, narrowly missing mountains, and being at times very close to the ground. I shuddered when I tried to imagine the rude awakening I would have had if the globe had struck a mountaintop in Borneo while I was peacefully asleep on my inflated mattress. The Pacific Ocean is the biggest body of water in the world. Krakatoa, which was only 18 square miles in size, was one of the smallest islands in the Pacific. I set out to land in Asia, the world's biggest continent, completely missed many enormous islands, traveled thousands of miles over water, and landed on this tiny piece of land.
Had a sea captain set out across the Pacific for, let us say, China and missed it by a few thousand miles and landed in Seno, Krakatoa, he would have been stripped of his commission and had his ship taken away from him. But two balloonists, stories such as mine are typical, and balloon trips are only considered unusual if you arrive within 100 miles or so of your planned destination. I was thinking how delightful this all was, of the freedom and surprise of balloon travel, and of the balloon merry-go-round I had taken such a fantastic trip on that afternoon. Then it occurred to me that the balloon merry-go-round was a pretty big affair, and it seemed to me that it should be visible when up in the air on a clear day from either Java or Sumatra. I asked Mr. F. about this while we were basking in the sun. We don't worry too much about that, he said. There are several reasons why. One of them is that the balloon merry-go-round is painted sky blue and therefore isn't really visible from too great a distance. Another is that the balloon merry-go-round never goes over five or six miles on its longest trips, and that doesn't bring it very close to Sumatra or Java. Then, too, the mountain has a reputation for belching forth strange things, and the whirling balloons and boats look quite like a big blue smoke ring from the distance. But there is this very important reason why we don't worry about it being seen. In 1877, our second year here, the mountain was so violent that it scared the people living on the shores of the Sundra Strait in both Java and Sumatra so much that they moved their homes inland about 25 miles on the island, both of them. The whole of Krakatoa was violently rocked from end to end. Waves were formed in the Sundra Strait, traveling outward from the island as a center. Giant waves which swept onto the shores of Java and Sumatra, completely inundating many homes. The noise was formidable, and the waves caused so much damage that the people moved away from the tips of the islands in great haste. We have reason to believe that no one dares to live within a 50-mile radius of us. Great heavens, I exclaimed. How did such an explosion affect you who were living right here on the island? It was quite bad. Many of the huts we lived on at the time collapsed like card houses. No one was hurt much, though many of us were knocked unconscious or had the wind knocked out of us from being thrown abruptly to the ground. The noise of the explosion wasn't too bad on the island. I suppose the fact that we were right on the island made the noise more bearable. If you stand right near or on a large artillery piece when it's fired, you're much less bothered by the noise than if you are 50 feet away. We picked ourselves up, helped those who needed help, and went about the business of rebuilding our house. This brought up another point that had been puzzling me. Why, I asked Mr. F., do you people live here on top of this dormant volcano, when with a handful of diamonds you could live a life of lavish ease and comfort in any other country? Your question is a puzzler, and there is really no logical answer to it. It suggests a series of other questions of exactly the same nature. For instance, why doesn't a millionaire in any other country consider himself rich enough to retire? Why does he try to make another million? Why did tycoons with several millions of dollars try to make a billion, a sum so huge they couldn't possibly spend it in a lifetime? As long as our diamond mines are kept secret here, we, the 20 families of Krakatoa, match the rest of the world in wealth. The diamond mines have a peculiar magnetic effect on us. We couldn't live happily in any other country. We would be haunted with the unbelievable dream of this unheard of wealth back on the island. But we can't take our diamonds, that is all of our diamonds, to another country without destroying their value. We are slaves of our own piggishness. We have locked ourselves in a diamond prison. On the other hand, we're very happy here. And I suppose the fascination of knowing that we are each one of us richer than the combined Midases, Nabobs, and Croissy of history enters too into the Krakatoan spell which keeps us here. But this spell, as you call it, seems a little unreasonable to me for the simple reason that it challenges a will of human nature that is far greater than the will to be rich, this being obviously the will to live. How can you live happily here under the constant threat of being blown sky high? Now that I think of it, this whole island is like a turkey stuffed with nitroglycerin. The surface of the earth here, which is right at this moment moving us gracefully up and down, is obviously activated by molten lava. A crack in the earth's surface and the cold waters of the Pacific would rush in. Imagine what would happen then. Cold water coming suddenly in contact with molten lava. This hollow rumbling shell would suddenly find itself like a covered kettle of boiling water on a stove. The resulting steam would cause pressure enough to blow the top right off the whole island. No one could survive such an explosion. What good would your diamonds do you then? We're all only too much aware of this possibility. It troubles me just to hear you mention it. We have come to look upon it this way. If it should happen with the speed with which you have just described it, nobody here would have time to think or know what was happening to him. It would mean a painless death. However, 
if we have a warning, which we can somehow expect to have, there is a quick escape from Krakatoa. Given as little time as 10 minutes to get off the island, we'll all be safe and on our way to some other country. This escape and the fact that Krakatoa has been here an uncalculated length of time without blowing up makes living here under the ever-present threat of extinction possible. What is this escape, I asked. Do you keep a freighter always steamed up and ready to go? It would take the freighter longer than 10 minutes to leave here, said Mr. F. It's not that. It's the other invention I promised to show you today. This is an invention we all worked carefully on for many months, starting right after the big explosion in 1877. Our lives depend on it, but due to its huge size and its motivating power, we are unable to try it out. There's no reason why it shouldn't work, and when I say this, I mean no reason on paper. Its maiden voyage will have to prove its worth. It's a flying platform, a huge platform big enough to take all of us swiftly into the air within 10 minutes of a warning from the mountain. A platform capable of lifting 20 families of four, I asked? This makes child's play of flying carpets. How do you hope to get it off the ground? With balloons, answered Mr. F. This idea appealed to me immensely. There. The idea of the lives of 80 people being entrusted to such fickle and unpredictable traveling companions as balloons was quite frightening, but thoroughly enjoyable. You are all prepared to risk your lives in a balloon contraption. I like this very much. A little while back, I was starting to think of Krakatoans as being greedy, calculating, and traditionally dull billionaires. Now I find you are incurable romantics. Tell me, how can such a massive weight as that of 80 families be lifted off the ground? I beg your pardon, said Mr. F., but we are not risking our lives on any foolhardy conveyance. The balloon platform must work. It's got to work. It can't help but working. Look, I'll show you. I walked over to where Mr. F. was lying, sat down beside him, and watched him as he sketched the platform in the sand. He made a bird's eye view of it and drew the 20 balloons around its outside edge. It was rectangular in shape. He started writing numbers in the sand. I don't know how much the actual platform weighs by itself, he said. It is made of the lightest pine wood in the world, imported by us especially for this purpose from South America. It is made of light beams, and the floorboards are laid with spaces between them for greater lightness. The balustrade around the platform is of hollowed wood. The woodwork couldn't possibly have been made lighter. Before I tell you about the balloons, I want to make it clear that I'm going to give you the figures in round numbers with the margin of error all in favor of the success of the machine. Thus, the lifting power of the balloons will be calculated as a little less than it actually is, and the weight we are carrying will be computed as heavier than it would actually be. There's really no accurate way of planning balloon inventions. Too much depends on atmospheric conditions, the purity of the hydrogen used, and weather conditions. I'll give you the roundest of figures. I understand, I said. The balloon platform is lifted by 10 large balloons of 32,400 cubic feet each, and 10 balloons half as big as the larger ones of 16,200 cubic feet each. The larger balloons will fly higher, and the smaller ones will be situated in the spaces between the larger ones, thus alternating around the platform, one large, one high, and one small, one low, etc. I see, I said. The total hydrogen needed to fill all 20 is 486,000 cubic feet. Free hydrogen has a lifting power of roughly 70 pounds per thousand cubic feet. The 20 balloons have a combined lifting strength of 45,360 pounds. How much do you figure the 80 people will weigh? Well, he said, writing down more figures in the sand. If you divide the 80 people by sexes, half are women. If you divide them by generations, half are children. 130 pounds per person is a safe figure under these circumstances. The 80 people will weigh 10,400 pounds. But let me see. How much do you weigh? In the roundest of numbers, I answered, I weigh 180 pounds. All right, said Mr. F. There's a sketch of the balloons. That makes 10,580 pounds, leaving 34,780 pounds over to take care of the total weight of the platform. I agreed that this all sounded very reasonable. But one thing bothers me, I said. How do you get the balloons filled with hydrogen and the platform off the ground in 10 minutes? That was our most difficult problem. Come with me, I'll show you the platform and how we think we've solved the question of a fast getaway. I put my bathrobe on and followed him through the jungle fringe. After a good long walk, we came to a clearing which was as far away from the mountain as it was possible to get on the island. The huge platform was situated here. I remembered having seen it from the balloon merry-go-round the day before. I had thought then, seeing it from the air, that it was some sort of outside dancing floor with a bandstand in the middle. What I thought was the bandstand turned out to be a large steel cylinder. 
Mr. F showed me four great wooden vats, one on the ground near each side of the balloon platform. They were ho hoses leading from the vats to the balloons in what Mr. F described as pitchfork connections. The hoses were large and single as they left the vats, then branched off into smaller hoses, each one attached to a balloon. This is how we believe we've solved the problem of a quick takeoff, he said, compressed hydrogen. Each of these vats contains 300,000 cubic feet of hydrogen compressed at 1,600 pounds to the square inch. The hydrogen is kept in steel cylinders, which are submerged in water in the vats to keep leakage down to a minimum and keep the hot rays of the sun from direct contact with the cylinders. In the event of an emergency, we will all rush to the platform, jump on, and each family will stand by a balloon. The big valves in the four vats will be turned on full force. Each family will have to see that its balloon is carefully handled so that the tremendous rush of hydrogen into it won't cause any tears, rips, or snarls. The smaller balloons will fill first. There's a lever near each balloon which controls the valve, allowing gas to enter it. When the small ones are three quarters full, their valves will be shut off. Shutting off the smaller balloon's valves will speed the filling of the big ones since they'll be receiving all of the pressure. Here's a picture of the vats and the hoses as it like he sketched out. Mr. F then picked up one of the hoses and showed it to me. There was a sort of ball and socket connection in each hose. He explained that it took a 150 pound pull to separate the hose at this connection. Each hose has a connection like this, he explained. 20 hoses makes a total pull of 3,000 pounds. The balloon platform isn't tied down with ropes before the takeoff. It is held down only by these hoses. Gas rushes into the balloons until the platform rises and there is a 3,000 pound pull on the 20 hoses. The platform then tears itself away from the hose connections and leaps into the air as if it were given a huge boost. There's a valve in the ball end of each ball and socket connection. It allows gas to be forced into the balloon, but prevents gas from escaping when the connection with the vats is broken. When the balloon platform is in the air, the hoses will be pulled in and attached to hoses from this smaller compressed hydrogen tank on the platform itself. It is with the hydrogen on the platform that flight will be controlled. There's the ball and socket connections that they're talking about for the hoses so that gas can go in, but it can't go out, kind of like when you blow up an air bed or air mattress. How can you control the flight of the platform? By adding hydrogen to the balloons, let's see there, we can go higher to a certain extent. By detaching the hoses from the tank on the platform and releasing hydrogen from the balloons, we can make the platform descend. Where we go is, as usual, when you, as usual, left entirely to the winds. However, since we carry our own hydrogen supply, there's no reason why, with any sort of a wind and a minimum of luck, we can't travel a tremendous distance. How do you keep the platform level? We plan to do that in much the same way as we keep the balloon merry-go-round level, only the process will be reversed. We have no desire to take long trips in the balloon merry-go-round, so we keep it level by releasing hydrogen from the high side until it's even with the low side. On the balloon platform, we will add hydrogen to the low side to bring it up level with the high side so the platform as a whole will gain altitude instead of descending. Each family will stand near its balloon on the platform, thus distributing the weight fairly evenly. There is a lever near each balloon, as I've already shown you, which controls the gas going into the balloon. The boy in each family will control the lever because of his greater experience with the balloon merry-go-round. When his balloon is a little lower than the others, he'll add more gas to it and bring it up even with them. I walked around on the platform. The floorboards were springy underfoot and you could see grass underneath through the spaces between them. I tried to imagine this huge floor in flight, looking through the boards at a city underneath. How frightening and incredible it would be to be moving through space on such a huge piece of construction with 80 other people. The balloons were carefully folded and under tarps. I took a careful look at several of them. They were magnificent, made of beautiful rubberized silk and each balloon was painted many different iridescent colors. I tried to picture the reaction of people in other countries if they were suddenly to look up in the sky and see the balloon platform, its white latticed floor bordered by a graceful balustrade over which were leaning the richly clothed Krakatoans, the twenty brilliant balloons above, and the frightening silence with which a huge airship would suddenly make its appearance. There is no noise in balloon travel. In any other form of travel, you're warned by some sort of noise of the approach of whatever the conveyance. Even ships cause a ripple of waves in the calmest of waters. Balloons are silent, except on the rare occasions when you might possibly hear the ghostly whistle of the wind through the ropes. There's no nicer way of traveling than in some form of lighter-than-aircraft.
The balloon platform would certainly make a delightfully attractive appearance if it should have to fly over any foreign country, I remarked. "'Its appearance played a big part in the planning,' said Mr. F. "'It wasn't really necessary to go to all the trouble we did "'in making the handsome, hollow-carved wooden balustrade "'or put so much thought, work, and time "'into the painting of the balloons. "'A lighter, simpler balustrade and plain balloons "'would have made the platform fly just as well. "'If we should have to land in other countries, "'we want to be welcomed as extraordinary visitors "'who have gaily announced their arrival, "'rather than be suspected of being invaders "'in some sort of aerial Trojan horse.' By the way, he added, have you a parachute? Of course not, I answered. I threw everything overboard on the globe. I didn't carry one anyway. I didn't feel I needed one. Each family here has a family parachute, another invention of ours. A family parachute is so built as to keep a family of four together during a descent. Isn't it possible to land the balloon platform? Hardly so, said Mr. F. In the first place, it would be hard to find enough level space in which to land such a huge aircraft. And in the second place, it wouldn't be possible to deflate the balloons fast enough to prevent the wind from blowing it and dragging it across the countryside. We would have to deflate them slowly in order to make a reasonably smooth landing. And before we would be able to collapse them, the wind would drag us off, ripping the platform into splinters and endangering our lives. We wouldn't dare risk a landing in this. We plan to jump off, picking our countries and spots with care, if we ever have to take a trip on it. Professor Sherman, I would advise you to get a parachute as soon as you possibly can. How can I get one in Krakatoa, I asked. See Mrs. M. She and her husband designed and made the family parachutes. I'm sure she has enough silk left over to make you an ordinary one. We went together to M's Moroccan house and I told Mrs. M my problem. Why, certainly, she said, I can make you a parachute, but it will take me about two weeks. But then I doubt if you'll be needing it before then. I hope not anyway, she said, laughing. Of course not, I said. Take your time. There's no rush at all. And I was wrong. Sorry. There's another chapter. One more chapter. Stay tuned.